Hey people, welcome to League of Video Gamers tutorial video. My name is JJ Skywalker, and today I just want to say right now that thank you guys so much for the tons of positive feedback you guys have given back to me. It is a truly an awesome help. I've never had this many views in my videos for a 36 subscriber channel. Trust me, this is huge for me, guys. So again, thank you so much for uh, giving such positive feedback and suggestions that I simply can't remember on my own, you know. So. Again, thank you so much and keep them coming, guys. I, I love explaining this stuff. So anything you guys need help on, I'm glad to be of help. And thank you so much for sticking around. Now today, for this tutorial vid, we're going to be going over QT9296's comment on uh, a ton of stuff that I think would be perfect for you guys to know. Now, I am currently in the works of a PvP and... Uh, dino PvP video so that is along the way but it's taking me much longer and it is in progress than uh, this current video I can easily just push all these nice tips for you guys really quick but the PvP video I'm actually getting SOTF footage and so on and so forth so that is taking me uh, that is taking me a bit nonetheless uh, I hope this, these uh, current tips help you guys out and if you're uh, up for some PvP tips those are along the way now I'm gonna be going over these uh, the questions he asked in my own order. Sorry if QT you're watching and you want it in your order, my bad. But I'm gonna be going over it in an order that would uh, suffice because a lot of the questions uh, were very similar to each other, and I feel like uh, tackling them in a specific order would be neat. Now, first question to tackle would be base size. You asked about base size. Now, when it comes to base size, whenever I'm in a 2v2 or a 4v4, probably even a 6v6, I tend to go with a 2x2, two two, which is four foundations. Now, with that, I just make a nice one-story house with six walls around and then four ceilings on the top to cover it. And I'm able to put everything inside, almost like three to five forges, a smithy, and uh, maybe a few campfires on the inside if I need to, but for the most part I put uh, campfires outside. The reason for this is, uh, honestly, if you're trying to be compact, probably a, uh, two foundations and then one off to the side would be good. But with a 2x2, two two, it adds that little extra space for you to walk around, so it's definitely useful, especially if you need to get out of a bind. Having a crowded base and being attacked is not the ideal situation, so a 2x2 two two is perfect for its small size and its uh, red ability for, I guess, escaping and escape situations. Uh, honestly, your base size is completely up to you, but remember that you are kind of like in a time situation. So building a too big of a base would not be, uh, you'd be wasting a lot of time and building a, a very, very small base makes you a much more easier target for your enemy. Now, if you are going for a fabricator though, you can use the same template, but you're going to be doing a two-story house with that. And then you're going to add a catwalk in the top. It's like this little small plank that you can make and add to like the in between this first and second stories. And you can actually place the fabricator above the smithy if you place a catwalk above the smithy. Uh, moving on to the next question. Uh, how not to get lost is how I wrote it. So uh, I don't have a picture, I'm sorry, but the best way for you not to get lost is honestly looking up. If you look up, you can actually very easily see the ring uh, or the, I guess I could say, circumference of the ring uh, closing in on you. You can use that to know where the middle of the arena is because anywhere away from the wall or basically the radius of the wall, if you guys no uh, small math terms um, would be the middle of the map so simply look up get away from the wall and you'll probably be heading to the middle I guarantee it uh, it won't lead you anywhere else so that's an excellent way how not to get lost just look up and try to see uh, the circle that is the wall now uh, 
Question number three, it was on the usefulness of the map. Now the map is not completely useful, but at the same time it is not useless. I believe it is tons more useful in a normal arc just to like coordinate with teammates if you had actual coordinates. And that brings us to the fourth question, which is how do I know my chords as well? Um, you, you can't know your chords, honestly, like unless you've played the game for so long that like uh, most players, just, you just know almost every part of the map you just can't know your chords on your own i i mean it took me so long to diversify south from east because i thought when i initially played the game i had spawned on south spawn but in fact i had actually spawned on east spawn so my east was my south and my south was my west and i had messed up very bad and it took me almost 500 hours to finally realize that and, um, I mean, uh, yeah, no, I mean, you can't know your chords. And if you ever play normal arc, there's a thing called the GPS, and I mean, that is the best thing to know your chords. If the compass was in the game, I mean, you guys would know your north, south, east, and west, but, again, uh... Th that can be figured out in certain ways, and I think the best way to figure it out, and probably the best way for math usefulness, is when you press M, you can also press P, and P allows you to add markers. Now, for a beginner player, I would suggest marking the obelisks, which is the red, the green, and the blue obelisk. Now, uh, in the free-for-all, for the most part, you're always going to be seeing the blue obelisk, for the most part. You're going to be in its uh, direct, vis direct visual contact unless you're in the forest. Now, uh, look up the chords on Google. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, wait. Uh, maybe I can provide them. Sorry, I'm just recording this as I go. But I've probably already put up a picture of the map on the screen. Um, as you can see, Blue Obelisk is 48.9 and 72.2. Uh, hopefully this is right. And, uh, I mean, Grand Peak is generally where the SOTF uh, map was changed. Now, this looks a little different, of course with um, normal arc being completely different than uh, survival of the fittest arc, mainly the middle circle. Uh, but everyone starts on basically Grand Peak and then Deep Island is what is known as Bronto Valley and it has its metal notes. But for the most part, you're going to be in sight of the green obelisk and the blue obelisk. Now putting that on your map, you can generally tell where you are. Honestly, in free for all, you don't need to know where you are. For the most part, don't cross the beach. Beach is a little too far unless you want to go for uh the metal mountain close by for like a bit but honestly that the amount of time you'll have at metal mountain is super small and a free-for-all but yeah i mean uh, generally you're always going to be east of green knob at well north east of green knob and you're always going to be west of blue obelisk so you can generally i guess uh use those markers to help yourself and of course there's volcano which is grand hills and I mean, those are your biggest landmarks to know where exactly you're at. Vol uh, where exactly you're at. Uh, volcanoes always north. Blue Obelisk is gonna tend to be at your uh, east, and your, the Green Obelisk is gonna be in your uh, southwest. So you're always gonna be north east of Green Ob. Uh You're always gonna be west of Blue Ob, and you're always gonna be tend to be south of Volcano. So. Uh, use those markers uh, to your liking and that's probably the best usefulness I can tell for you on the map uh, using P and marking those uh, specific landmarks and kind of coordinate with yourself I mean it is a literal assertion of a map no technology put ahead of it you know and I honestly like that uh, it adds to the uh, I guess the discovery and survival part of arc but in SOTF I, I, I don't think it's too useful but if you guys need it you need it uh next on the list is how far out mid should i go now that requires a very specific explanation i guess i can go over it at 30 minutes i would say that the arena would be somewhere around a little bit north of grand hills it's right on frozen tooth in this map and uh, probably crossing over the western approach, the southern, a little bit uh, east of the southern jungle, um, right on footpall, and then barely, barely, barely starting like in like the south of uh, Meadow Mountain right here. And then of course, I believe Blue Obelisk is engulfed at that point, and then it just finishes off the circle right there. Now, honestly, the farthest off you should go mid, would I would just say the beaches 
and probably uh, a quick trip to Volcano if you see a drop or you want a specific tame. It honestly depends on what you want. If you're looking for a specific tame, if you're looking for Sabretooth and Argent in a free-for-all, then you need to do that by literally the first five to 10 minutes of the game. Head north over here and you're gonna be, e you'll easily find them and you'll have probably enough time to tame one to, to uh, one to three, five if they're all, they all happen to be there. Right, when you get there and you happen to have all the resources to tame them, if you're going to uh, the mountain, you can probably get a few oil, uh, a few metal to get your initial resources, and then you can move back across the beach. Uh, to me, it's a little too much work, but I know some people actually do it. And um, then set up your smithy and such, and I mean, you can get some stuff done from there, but I wouldn't suggest staying at the mountain, because I will tell you that by 20 minutes, the the barrier tends to get very close to the middle already probably already crossing the beach by that point metal mountain is gone volcano is definitely gone at that point it's probably on the sh the the opposite side shores from the north and the south of course it's already past west and east because west and east is a little much farther than the north and south shores and by 10 minutes uh, i mean it's already unbelievably close if you don't have your stuff done by then chances are you're not going to get anything done whether it be taming or tech so at that point i would just suggest if you have nothing just make a ton of arrows grab a ton of thin berries and prepare the, for the fight of your life uh when it comes to a bigger assortment of games you can literally magnify that by probably, uh, I guess, a magnitude of 30 minutes. So everything I just said basically add 30 minutes to it. Like going out to Meadow Mountain, you can probably hang out there for the next 30 minutes, and then you have to go in. And then you can, uh, ha uh, if you want to build uh, another smithy and keep building more, you can tackle the metal nodes close to the middle. You can hang out there for somewhere around 30 minutes and keep building and so on and so forth but honestly uh, personally my strategy for me is uh, to stay very close to the middle honestly I mean you never have to worry about anything other than players just hanging around but I mean eliminating other players for me isn't so much of a problem unless they're completely out teching me or out taming me then it is a problem but I enjoy eliminating other players and eliminating the competition that is aggressive so staying close to the middle of the map is useful to me because I never have to be in a hurry but if I'd have to go a ways out, like if I want to tame something specific or get to a specific metal node spot that is far away from the middle, I tend to try to always make myself be between the middle of the wall and the, I guess, middle of the map. As in, I'm all, I always have a good maybe 10 to 20 minute buffer before the wall gets to me. If it gets further than that, I, it literally gets crazy if I have teams. It's going to be hard getting through the forest and such, and uh, so on and so forth. So yeah, <laughs> if you guys need a more specific explanation, like you want to know uh, 2v2s, 4v4s, 6v6s, I can figure that out. I honestly don't know the specific numbers. I know definitely for 6v6s, it being, because I'm used to three hour games from the original SOTF, I know that it probably goes on the complete outside of the island but I'm not completely sure but I can definitely figure that out for you guys and if you really really want to know then I don't mind making a video on that either or just simply commenting to you. Uh, question number six is what stats are ideal or as I wrote it what stats are ideal now honestly again this is completely up to you I know a lot of people that tend to just go completely health stat at the beginning that is amazing for people who happen to ha be have a lot that's amazing for people who happen to have amazing accuracy they hit you in the head and I mean you've got a buffer of health that, that is awesome some people still go speed I go speed a little bit of speed I mean having a little bit more speed than your enemies since most people don't go it it's awesome as well most players tend to uh, put at least 10 points of weight into their character now that would go from 200 to 300 each point of weight adding 10 points of weight so yes you would hit from 200 to 300 weight this is helpful for carrying a lot more such as metal I tend to see people only use this for tech but I think it'd be good for team just in case you go to any drops or something and you want to pick stuff up you don't want to be encumbered so having 300 weight would be ideal. Also, if you get picked up by a bird and such, and you have a lot of weight on you, it will basically make their bird either not be able to move or slower than they were expecting. So that's also good. I have not recently added points to stamina, but adding points to stamina isn't bad either. 
being able to run for longer and such. But honestly, with stim berries at your side, I just don't see a point to adding stamina on the very late levels when I'm like maybe level 50 or something. I tend to think, oh, well, I guess I could use a full few points on stamina, so I start adding stamina, but I don't think stamina is worth it as much in SOTF. You could add oxygen, but honestly, oxygen isn't like ideal for your end game situation. Like, if you're going to be in water that much, you could probably use a tame to swim across, but adding extra, oh, well, if you guys didn't know, adding oxygen increases the amount you can stand in water, but it also increases your speed in water. So, that's a good thing to know. I completely forgot to mention that. Your movement speed doesn't increase your water speed, your oxygen increases your water speed. So, increasing your oxygen will increase your water speed, but again, that's not useful. By the, you're going to probably need a 300 to 400 oxygen uh, to outspeed piranhas, and at that point you have wasted too many points in oxygen you could have put into better stats. So I don't really suggest oxygen, but I mean, if, again, if you need it, you need it. So, uh, Another stat would be melee. Early game melee is amazing. Honestly, I mean, if you're in a fight with a person uh, with a spear, both of you have spears and you're fighting each other, uh, whoever has, and you happen to both get consecutive hits on each other, whoever has the highest melee is going to win, just naturally. And if you have a sneak attack on someone while they're not watching and, and you're trying to decide between trying to get the uh, iffy headshot or just spear them before they even get to react then having high melee damage will help you get like amazing sneak attacks and kills i know there's some guys who go pure melee damage and i mean the second they get close to you you're gone <laughs> two hits three hits and boom your character's gone if you have no armor so that's definitely um, something amazing to go so overall i would just suggest uh, uh considering your melee your health your uh, uh, slight amount of weight and then your movement speed but again it's all up to you guys the way you play the way you want to build and yeah moving on to question seven is cave loot worth it now this question i haven't even considered in my entire pl uh, or no not in my entire well no yes in my entire time playing sotf because when it, uh, back then when caves were actually viable in long games i'm talking three to four hour games uh, caves were an interesting place to base up because they were, uh, I mean, it was a bottleneck. You had enemies only coming in from one side, so if you defended it hard enough, literally nobody would be able to sneak up on and you and kill you, so it was amazing. But now that they've added uh, things to make cave enemies very OP, such as bats knocking you out, and then of course there's snakes in there that actually knock you out, and then there's, oh, I don't know, scorpions that actually knock you out. Uh, everything in there knocks you out so literally if you get two, two hits on you from one of those guys you're out so the risk is too high for that type of reward now I'm not exactly and I say that because I'm not exactly sure what the reward is now a normal arcade loot was nerfed hugely cave loot is not worth it you'll be getting cloth hats from it sometimes I'm not sure if the cave loot is different from normal arc to SOTF because I actually haven't even looked but just because again the risk is too high for that type of reward and most cave loot tends to be singular it's only like one item or maybe three at max and they're not even that great as far as I remember now SOTF could be different but I don't think it is I think they haven't changed anything from cave loot that being said, almost nobody goes caves anymore, uh, maybe for long games like 6v6s or if they ever decide to make a tournament again, you'll be seeing people trying to contest caves again, especially since they've got metal, maybe a few obsidian, some interesting tames in there, uh, other than uh, I'm not sure if spiders are still tameable in, the, in these builds, but I know snakes aren't, bats aren't, and they knock you out. So again, risk is too high for the reward, and no, I do not think cave loot is viable. Now for the next uh, question, it's not going to be a question, it's actually going to be a little add-in. I'm going to put in, and I think I was going to put this in for the PvP video, but I'm going to put this in here anyway, and it's on aggression changes. Now I'm not sure if I went over it in previous videos, and that's why I want to put it in here, because I've been watching those videos tons of times, but I can't remember putting this in. Now aggression changes is the aggression change of a dino, like a hostile dino. Uh, a dino like a Gigantopithecus or the Monkey Man or the Sasquatch won't change aggression because the specific aggression is on you, but for general aggression dinos like 
carnivore, uh, like carnivores such as T-Rexes, carnos, raptors, spinos, and such, they tend to aggro anything. Therefore, if you ever have that type of dino aggroing you, you can easily walk over or run through, like, around, and then, you know, kind of, like, put the path of the enemy dinosaur on that dino, and he will change aggression to the dino you just passed, and or the person, if it just happens to be a person. This is very useful for getting out of situations that you're just like, oh my god, I'm gonna die, this raptor's too fast for me. Oh look, parasaur. You run next to the parasaur, run past it, and the raptor changes aggression to the parasaur. Moment it changes aggression, get the heck out of there and allow that raptor to just chase the parasaur down. And or pig. Pigs and parasaurs are perfect, by the way, because they're kind of tanky and they run fast. So they're going to get that carnivore out of there. Um, it also helps you for tranking. If you're ever trying to trank a dino, using the aggression of another dino is perfect. The only problem is that dino's going to... If, it is in a, uh, if that dino attacks back, it's going to be, you know... Well, attacking the dino you're taming so whenever you're taming a t-rex you might want to get it on a turtle or something and then tame the t-rex the moment that t-rex goes down kill the turtle because chances are the turtle is attacking the t-rex and i mean that's an interesting tip to give you guys uh but it also leads to the next question qt had which was uh tranks should i pull them all the way also should i spam them is how i wrote the question and that is an interesting question. Now, should you pull all the way? No, I don't think so. The an uh, with the animation changes to the bow, I don't think it matters when you push it too much. Or pull, I'm sorry, pull it back too much. But I always pull it back for a fraction of a second. A fraction of a second just in case that it does matter. Because honestly, again, the animation is too fast to actually know. In the original... Or if you have a compound bow, you'll notice that the pullback is significant. And I know for a fact that pulling it all the way back, I think it does do more damage than it normally would if you don't pull it all the way back. So I always hold the shot for like a very slight second. And by that time, you're probably already full strung and you can just let it go. So maybe like 0.7 milliseconds, just or 0.7 seconds. Just hold it back and just let it go real quick. Just kind of just kind of slow burst now should you spam a dino and i think the specific question was should you spam the dino till it falls with trends and yes and no uh that requires a very specific i guess explanation on taming mechanics and the type of damage multipliers trank arrows have but for the most part i can quickly explain that in the original game a uh, bow with a trank arrow does 20 damage to an enemy and the way Turper works for a bow is that the Turper that the enemy that you shoot a Trank Arrow will get will equal 200% of the damage dealt. So if the damage is in fact 20, then you'll be doing an instant amount of 200% Turper of that 20. So 20 times 200%, that should be 40. And then over a time of 4 seconds, it'll be doing 200, an additional by the way, of 250% of the damage you just did. So it should be doing 50 Turper over 4 seconds. Now should you spam? Honestly, yes. With that amount of damage, it's just super small. So spamming it, honestly, the main portion of your Trank damage is going to be that initial 200% that you're going to be doing. And that's what you're going to be trying to count on. So uh, especially if you see easy headshots to the head of the dino, remember that headshots probably do somewhere around 250% extra damage. And that does add to the Turper uh, uh, multiplier. So uh, 20 times 200%, which would be 40 times 250%, that should be somewhere around 100 damage instantly every shot, not including the t additional 250% that you're doing. So that would be 20 times 250 times 250 over a four second time. Uh, so yes, definitely. If you see a, uh, a dino's head, I would highly su suggest just spamming it into its head. But even then, if you just see its body, yeah, spam into it. Uh, honestly, you're going to be a little bit more wasteful, but in this survival and SOTF type situation, honestly, being wasteful isn't too bad. The gathering rate isn't too bad, so you can easily get more arrows, more tranks, so it, it doesn't really matter. But um, yes, go ahead spam away <laughs> and uh, i believe that's it for the questions qt provided and the stuff i wanted to let you guys know for this video yeah it's kind of 
a little bit long enough, somewhere around 30 minutes. So again, thank you so much for watching. This has been an honor tackling these questions for you guys, honestly. And it's been fun as well. I get to, I've honestly learning some stuff that I hadn't, you know, learned in a long time and reviewing a lot of old tactics that I used to do and basically going over in my head what I try to do, what I should be doing and so on and so forth. And I think I've become a better player for it. So thank you so much, guys. If you like the video, please like it, and honestly, if it was horrendous, please dislike it and subscribe if you'd like to see more tutorial videos and or league action. Again, for the millionth time, thank you guys, and good luck surviving out there, and see you later.